Uh, I think we have a really interesting uh, session here about one of the first Nordic impact funds and how they came to take action at that. And for those of you who were here yesterday, I think it's kind of a bookend maybe to the session with Hampus Jacobson, the uh, tech entrepreneur who is just tiptoeing into thinking about investing in impact and trying to figure out what discount to return he should expect with a fair trade coffee chain or something like that where he's just tiptoeing in and he's not quite sure about it. Here we have some folks in the Nordics who have taken real action uh, doing one of these first funds and then we also have uh, an investment banker from J.P. Morgan, Tony Rosingholm, who uh, is looking at this in the Nordic countries, in Europe, globally, and, and in lots of uh, geographies all over. And is they're starting to understand what is the profile of an impact investor and how do they think about their money. So what we would like to do is put a Nordic fund in broader context. So we have Paul Dale in the middle, who is leading Voxtra, uh, one of the first Nordic impact funds. And then uh, Telef Thorlifsen is here in two roles. And so we, we find so many people in two roles here. He's one of the lead in investors in Spotify, one of the great Swedish uh, tech companies, the online music sharing link to Facebook uh, kind of thing, I, which I like uh, and my friends like. And I discovered the music my friends like. And yet he's the uh, on the investment committee and is helping figure out how to tell the story of Voxtra to folks who are greatly different than uh, people who would have invested in one of the three, uh, or is it three or four, three North Zone funds that you've raised that are, are in on the cutting edge of technology. So, Paul, if you can just set the context of what is Voxtra and just talk about what it is, and then we want to put it in broader context uh, and on how you raise the money and who that made sense to, and then uh, Tony will put it in a broader context. Mm, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, in Voxtra, we've uh, recently raised uh, a fund that uh, will invest in agricultural businesses in East Africa uh, that enables smallholder farmers uh, to increase their productivity. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about the situation of smallholder farmers in Africa, because that's really what was the starting point for us when we set up this fund. Um, smallholder farming in Africa is characterized by very, very low productivity. Um, if we take maize, which is the most important uh, crop in the region, a, a typical smallholder farmer gets about one hectare, uh, one ton per hectare, uh, while good farmers get about ten times that, larger farmers. Um, and even good smallholder farmers should be able to get five, six tons. So we're talking about a productivity gap of 5x. Um, and this is, is very much the root cause of poverty in Africa, uh, because most of the poor people in Africa are uh, smallholder farmers, and if that productivity gap could be addressed, um, uh, there would be much less poverty, much less hunger and malnutrition on the continent. Um, and so this fund aims to invest in companies that uh, provide um, quality inputs to smaller farmers that can be improved seed varieties that um, can enable them to double their yields. Uh, it aims to invest in processing and um, trading companies that source from smaller farmers, gaining uh, market access that is also uh, one of the bottlenecks um, to addressing that gap. So that's sort of the mission of this fund. Um, we closed it in November last year with um, 65 million Norwegian kroner. That's um, around 11, 12 million dollars. Um, that capital comes from Norfund, the Norwegian Development Finance Institution, about one third, and the remaining from uh, around 10 uh, private investors out of Norway and Sweden. So that's high net worth, that's the foundation, it's family offices, uh, etc. Um, the fund also has a technical assistance facility that we raised from NORAD, the Norwegian Bilateral, uh, which will enable us to do um, technical assistance projects in our portfolio to enable these, these companies to grow and scale more comfortably. Um, and then we said that we will invest this capital in around 10 companies. Uh, our ambition is to enable those companies to grow so that they reach 200,000 farmers more than they did previously, uh, and increase incomes uh, so that the uh, return to um, poor communities in Africa equals at least 8x the money that we invest. Those are the targets that we set for the fund. Um, and then we promised our investors that you know this is 
and you think not very many people have been uh, doing this type of investing. Um, small sizes, one million, one and a half million dollars into each company. Um, so we can't go out there and promise um, private equity type returns with that lack of, of data and track record. Um, we're saying that it's definitely going to be possible uh, to return the capital with a positive return. Uh, but if you want to invest with us, you're definitely investing for the impact um, and to preserve your capital and, and generate a, a moderate positive return. So that's, I guess, the basics. That's the, the basics. And uh, this is a new kind of investing. This is a new way of investing. And it's also, Voxtra is, isn't what it started out to be. Voxtra started with another concept and evolved. Can you say, talk about how you went from venture philanthropy to uh, actually being an impact investor yourself? Yeah. I, I can give that a crack. Um, Great. I mean, we, um, as you said, Voxtra started some four years ago. Uh, and the idea at that point in time was that um, we saw that the, there was an increasing amount of quite wealthy people mm -hmm. in the Nordics mm -hmm. who we thought and still think uh, could be willing and interested in, in giving money, in, in being philanthropic. There's not a long tradition of that in the Nordics because we feel we've been paying so much tax. So, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's, we leave it for the state to do that. But it's, but, but it's changing. And, and, and we saw also that the a group of of wealthy individuals in this part of the world who are willing to set aside some of the money uh, for doing something good. But there's also, for some good but also not so good reasons, uh, strong skepticism towards the traditional NGOs, towards the, the, the large, uh, the, the Red Cross type of organizations, because there's a, this perception that so much is uh, lost on the way before it ends up in, in a project in, in, for instance, a developing country. And, um, and therefore, we had the idea that we should build up um, um, uh, a team that could help to channel some of those funds and, and get these funds and put them into projects where they, we could measure mm -hmm. uh, and where we could have a real impact and where we could use some of the same skill set and methods that we use as investors in, in our daily jobs and to use that in philanthropy. Um, we w have been working on that for some years and, and doing that and involved in some projects but it's fair to say that it's tough to raise funds still. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have work to do. And a couple of the projects that we got involved with were projects that were also market-based, where we supported companies, but with grants as opposed to invest. And being an investor of background, uh, and, and as we like to use the market mechanism somehow, uh, we uh, started developing an idea, how about investing as opposed to giving grants? Mm -hmm. and to so it was from skepticism to giving and, and the, and the non-profit philanthropic method and efficiency that made you want to become a, an actual impact investment fund in the market, using the market, being subject to the market, including showing your return. I mean, not necessarily skepticism to giving, but, but rather seeing that that's based on our skill set, what we are good at, and right. also believing that... But also not wanting to give to inflated non-profits, so it's a, the efficiency of the market was one of your goals. That's right. Applying the efficiency of the market to doing good, yeah, yeah. And, and we're also seeing that for investors and for wealthy individuals, um, it's a bigger decision to give away money than it is to invest, even if mm -hmm. the investment is high risk. Mm -hmm. And that's really in the Nordic context. Uh, Pal, did you also have folks who came from giving who had to think about investing as doing good? Or was it mostly business people who said, I want to use what I understand to do good? Or did you have people coming from giving saying, gee, this is a more efficient way? Uh, most of our investors are um, uh, people from the business community com coming from that side. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a, a foundation among our investors who mm -hmm. have been used to um, to giving and are still giving, of course. Right. Uh, and uh, and definitely um, saw it just that way as you described. That mm -hmm. uh, this is an exciting new way of creating impact. Right. And it can have the advantages of creating something that's uh, inherently more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, than what you typically get to through 
more traditional types of right. uh, philanthropy. So they were a donor saying this is more sustainable, more financially sustainable kinds of things. Yeah, uh, and not necessarily yeah. as a replacement, <coughs> but as an add-on to there. So, right. so they're investing out of their endowment and not out of right. their grant right. money into this fund. So you have business people and investors who are adding the, the market mechanism to their way of doing good, and that makes sense to them. And for the donors, this is a, a, a way to add on, but it's a new way to do things. I, I see people coming in from both doors in, in a lot of sense into these funds, Tony, at least in the ones where it's individuals and foundations. Can you put this in context of what you're seeing as these funds are arising? Talk about numbers and talk about investor profile. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so when we, just as a way of background, so um, JP Morgan has a team called Social Finance and uh, what we do, we the team is very much run as a business and we invest JP Morgan's own proprietary capital into impact investment funds. We also produce market research that goes out to um, private bank clients, family offices and institutional investors. And we um, some of the funds that we invest into, we also place with institutional uh, investors and um, private bank clients. So. Um, just as a way um, of background, in terms of the investors uh, that look at impact investments, including ourselves, what we see is that we assess investments alongside, or basically along a, uh, a uh, metrics where we look at um, impact, return, and risks. And we have investments that we look at more as a capital preservation opportunities, um, where you have low yielding, um, uh, low yielding uh, investments. Um, and then further to the right of that axis, you have funds or investments that yield closer to commercial um, return. And um, as a function of the maturity and the scalability and the location of those investments, you will either find yourself on the on the left hand side of that axis or more towards uh, more towards the right. So um, what we uh, what we're quite focused on uh, is to get the right investment opportunities to the right investors. So you will tend to see that the investors that can look at um, capital preservation opportunities or low yielding opportunities tend to be the investors that do not have fiduciary responsibilities. So These those are individuals, family foundations. Those are individuals, family foundations that can effectively take some more risk and also do not have minimum return threshold requirements. When you look at institutional investors, they generally tend to have a minimum return threshold that they need to, to respect, but again, they will um, most likely take a fairly pragmatic view um, around the investment opportunities and probably also be prepared to take a somewhat lower return than they otherwise would for their uh, traditional investments. And that's when they're looking about their money. What is it? How are they looking at their impact along that same scale? So um, the uh, all of these investors are are looking for very clear impact. Um, and um, most of the investors that we talk to also want to see measurable impact and want to, you know, as the same for, for Volkstra, want to see funds that have a very clear um, focus on demonstrable positive social and or environmental impact and actually have a setup to, to measure that impact. And, um, that goes hand in hand with also what they're trying to achieve on the on the financial side. So again, the most successful uh, investment funds um, and investors tend to have a very focused um, value proposition, both in terms of impact, a very explicit intent at the outset, but coupled with a very uh, clear investment case um, and a very clear financial case. Mm -hmm. And for the people on the left side of that impact who were, let's, we call them capital preservation folks, that, it means they're also willing to pay for more impact. They're willing to take a concession to return. It, it's an investment, but they say, I'll pay something for the cost of doing good. Um, are you seeing more people coming that way? Is that an easier sale? Which, which, is, which is drawing more people and more heart attention and more dollar movement? It's a good question, effectively, because what we see is that effectively, 
on the left hand side where you have um, individuals, family offices that can invest but without the normal fiduciary responsibilities that institutional investors have, they have more flexibility, they can move more quickly and there's clearly a lot of interest uh, uh, from them. Um, in terms of overall dollar amounts, of course, institutional investors can, can, can put in more. But it, there is an interesting question around, you know, more impact or not. Mm -hmm. There will be a different kind of impact as we see it along that, um, along that line of return. So it's quite hard to say that you will have more impact if you are on the right hand side, uh, on the left hand side versus if you are on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. I think it comes back to maturity and scalability of the investment opportunities and, and where, you, um, where you start out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's interesting. And, and <coughs> Tell if you've talked about people who could see the value proposition of Voxtra and those who couldn't, and you said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase it if you could go further into it, what, the, the people who can see this can see two variables at once. They can see risk return and this third dimension of impact. Risk return over here, maybe we're on the right side with, with just the risk return and the left side with adding this third dimension. Can you talk about more about those people who this just didn't make sense. They invest over here, they give over here, or they do public good over here. Can you talk about that? The, the people don't get it, the people do. Yeah, I mean, because uh, in a way, when you talk about the term impact investing, yeah, you need mm -hmm. to have sort of two thoughts in your mind at the same time, because you, you want to make impact, but you also need and you want to have a financial result. Mm -hmm. Very often right. it's all about financial research, it's all about IRR, I mean, mm -hmm. when I raise funds for, Mm -hmm. For Noisone, mm -hmm. the, the venture business, uh, we go to pension funds and they only, at the end of the day, they care about IRR mm -hmm. and financial first or financial, but that's it in a way. Um, and um, But in this context for Voxtra, uh, we we had to find people who could see that it was possible to combine the two. Um, in, in the traditional world, for instance... Collision in, and combining. I mean, for instance, in Sweden... Causing this market to happen. In, in Sweden, the, there's been a tradition of... of there's been the business folks on the one hand, mm -hmm. and then you've had the, 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 the people who do good on the other hand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's been sort of uh, thinking that you can combine the two, that you can do through a business, that you can do something good, and you can measure it, and you can have a real impact. It takes time for people to sort of get that through. Mm -hmm. And, and um, yes, we did find people who saw that the, it's, you could have a two-dimensional thinking, but particularly among institutional investors, because they're not mandated to do so. Uh, you, you could find individuals who personally could be sympathetic mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. it, but they didn't have the mandate. So, so right. some institutions, and, and that's where I hope JP Morgan and others can help us, need to, because I think many of those that save their pensions through institutions would be interested in having some of the money mm -hmm. uh, in impact-related investments. Say, we as pensioners say, if a few percentage of our pension savings were to go into these kind of projects, we would like it. And, but in turn, we have to mandate these institutions to put, allocate some funds into that. Yeah. Right. And that obviously gets to the question of scale. So, Tony, what are the characteristics of potential investing projects who get the idea, and what do you find in common with investors who don't understand the mix of impact and, and financial return? Yeah, so, um, again, I think it comes back to, um, you know, uh, having the right investment opportunities for the right investors, I think also to tell Teller's point, is that, um, you know, clearly there is um, uh, a significant amount of interest from family offices and, uh, and, and high net worth um, for the space, um, impact investments more broadly. And, you know, when you look at, for example, the capital preservation opportunities, the way we see it is that is kind of one step in from philanthropy. But what we've seen is that investors, uh, private investors, find um, find those investment opportunities very interesting because they see it as a sustainable, efficient, not maybe an alternative, but a complement to, to their philanthropy. So it's new money that wasn't going into philanthropy. It's coming from those donors or the donor side? Again, it's a very good question. I think that um, there might be some additional money coming from um, private individuals into the impact investment market for capital preservation opportunities. But I think we'll also see a, a slight shift from giving to, to investing into impact investments when it comes to the capital preservation opportunities. And I think, again, you know, to... So new money and a shift of money. New money and the shift of money. I think to, 
Tell us point in terms of the institutional investors, there are some today that have a, a, a special mandate. And again, us, we have a special mandate to do this, but it requires a special mandate uh, because if not, it is, it is quite a hard thing to do to fit impact investments into a traditional portfolio. And it also requires, in our view, a, a separate setup when it comes to team resources. So we see that the investors today, institutional investors today that are leading uh, will be those that have a, um, a separate specific mandate to do this. And that generally comes from senior management mm -hmm. uh, because they believe it's the right thing to do. And it, <coughs> it's a new mandate. So how did, how did that change happen within organizations? What are you finding that, how are institutions being able to set up mandates? So um, this, this will take time. Uh, particularly for institutional investors. It requires, and, and also for, for private individuals, it requires a lot of education. It requires a lot of information out to those, uh, those investors. But, for example, when you look at banks, we initially set up the social finance team because we thought it was interesting, the right thing to do, started with investing our own capital. But of course, we've seen an increasing um, demand from clients. So, so from going to investing this, our own capital, pull from clients, it's more of a pull from clients and it's more client driven today. So um, it's, it's investor demand. I mean, uh, Catherine Fulton talks about it as a moral hunger that's driving the market. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think that's a good uh, yeah. that's a good expression. I think yeah. uh, I I think there is a I think there's clearly a shift in mindset. Absolutely, yeah. and now you know you got to go from that shift in mindset to actually practically make it happen, and that's right. I guess where we're hoping to to be able to play a, a role alongside the likes of uh, of Oxtra. Right, Paul. Yeah, moral hunger. I like that expression. That was uh, sort of what I was going to address. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I didn't have the term. Um, Within, within, within business, I mean, there, there's a lot of people, of course, with a social conscience, but they've worked in business and they haven't worked in the social. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as Telaf was saying earlier, that uh, they might have skepticism about traditional uh, philanthropy for various reasons, um, because the mindset of business and investing is often quite different from the mindset of traditional NGOs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you come to them and you have uh, a product mm -hmm. uh, that combines the two, it's sort of, huh, that's what I've been looking for without knowing that I was actually looking for it. Mm, mm. Um, so, so it's like this latent demand that pops, suddenly I want an iPad, suddenly I, I want an I impact yeah, investment. I think yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, there are some people, I still have to say, who don't get it or it takes a lot of education to uh, uh, yeah. make them sort of be able to relate to it. Uh, but there are also many out there who, who just get it like that. Um, yeah. It's what they were looking for, but they didn't know. Yeah. So, so that's one of the exciting things about impact investing is that it's, it has the potential to pull uh, people into uh, the social impact arena that mm -hmm. otherwise wouldn't be there. And, and these, you know, these are often uh, very resourceful people, both in mm -hmm. terms of capital and, uh, and talent. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and you have a rate of return that is concessionary. You're one of those where, where in, in her uh, words, it'd, it'd be capital preservation, but they're willing to take some less to get that impact. Uh, and so they're not earning as much as they would, but they're taking, you know, it's, it's lower return and higher risk for those folks because they had, but you didn't lead with the investor story. Tell me what it was that they bought and, and why a, a concession to, to return made sense to them. Yeah, I think um, uh, what made us uh, sort of able to, to attract that capital was that we uh, put the impact story first mm -hmm. uh, and talked to people who were generally uh, interested in being a part of uh, you know, trying out a new way of creating impact. Mm -hmm. um, and Have they been looking for a new way to create impact? Did, they, did you? <laughs> um, some perhaps had, but not very actively, you know, mm -hmm. busy people yeah, uh, yeah. interested, but not really having the time to yeah. allocate to it. But it, um, it was often a suggestion, oh, a new way to create impact. Create impact, do more. Uh, okay, it was that kind of thing. It wasn't, yeah, and, and uh, then, of course, when we're, go, when we're going around you. with people like Telef and, yeah. and, and Kim Wall, our chairman, who's mm. um, so the Mr. Private Equity in, in Norway, then, then it's real, it's there. Right. And they have to relate to it, I think, in a different way than if somebody was flying in from mm -hmm. uh, New York uh, trying right. to pitch something. Sure, sure. Um, um, yeah, so... so um, 
um, yeah, what, what was the question about? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so what was it? How did they think about their money after they, they what, what what they bought was right. impact? Right, we, we put the impact story first. Uh, then uh, on top of that, uh, I think, and, and Tono already mentioned it, it's, you need to have a credible uh, story around financial viability as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so within our investment focus... They didn't want to just have the money walk away. No, no. Yeah. Um, uh, there need to be some subs- a lot of substance there. Right. right. Uh, so although there's not a lot of track record in investing in small agribusinesses in, in East Africa, uh, there is some. Mm-hmm. And we made sure that we had that data. Right. Uh, right. So we could tell people roughly what they could expect. Right. And then you're going someplace say, where it wasn't totally a greenfield. Somebody had done something similar to what you're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, so, so we're working quite closely with a, a fund manager out of Kampala called Pearl Capital Partners. Mm-hmm. Um, they've been doing this sort of investing for six, seven years. So they, they're by far the most experienced within this space. Right. Um, so you kind of borrowed their track record to say we'll be part of that for a while. Yeah, we, we said we'll set up a co-investment partnership with these guys. We'll do mm-hmm. some of our deals together with them. We'll work closely with them. That will t- get us up the learning curve quickly. Uh, not least that enabled us to do a lot of due diligence on them so we knew what their right. track record was and we could right. say you know, this is roughly uh, what people could expect. Right. And then uh, we were just, uh, I guess, humble enough to say that uh, this is new. It's new to us. It's new to the world in many ways. Um, so we can't really go out there and, and promise this or that return. Right. But we're... Um, humble Norwegian approach. <laughs> Some people uh, might say that, yeah. Uh, but that was credible enough, together with the impact mm-hmm. story, to get people mm-hmm. interested in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. And, uh, you know, Tony, you've talked about there's the right spectrum and the left spectrum. and the right spectrum, there's not a, a, a discount to return, but it's larger money, and they, they have fiduciary responsibility. But how are investors in Europe and globally reacting to the concept of to get things going, we might need to give up some return, this concept of concessionary return? Where are they thinking about that and how do they think about that? Yeah, I think in terms of um, on the investor side, I think that's fairly well accepted Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that most of the investors that we deal with, even even for many of the institutional investors, they are. They seem prepared to take a somewhat discounted return uh, as long as it uh, meets their minimum target threshold. Um, so I think that investors generally, you know, more towards the right hand side are are relatively pragmatic, but they manage risk and the minimum return expectations differently from um, right. from how private individuals uh, look at it but when we look at the when we look at the um, investors direct investors um, so we did a research uh, we did a survey uh, last year together with gin the global impact investment uh, um, investing network where we looked at over 2200 private impact investments and we analyzed those um, along returns, risks, trying to get a view around what are achieved, uh, realized returns and what are expected returns. And um, what came out of that was, and this was largely related to a debt portfolio of investments, 75% of the investments were debt, is that the investors were primarily, uh, the invest- 60% of the investors did not um, expect to to have to take concessionary returns but Mm -hmm. the same group of investors 60 percent did respond effectively that they would be willing to take concessionary returns um in return for more impact so 60 percent said they didn't expect to but 60 percent said they would exactly it's uh uh, does that mean there are two minds about that what is it how does that i i think it's it's still the i think it's still it means that the the verdict is still out for the market i think that we have seen um we have seen more debt investments that we've seen equity investments to date in this market and there's no concession to return over time for doing debt in these impacts. And deals. so, again, I think for debt, I think the verdict is still out. What we have seen is that in terms of realized returns, they match up fairly closely to um, more commercial returns. But again, um, 
again, I think it is too early to say to have a definitive view around realized returns. And I think that is even more important around um, equity investments effectively because we're primarily looking at expected returns. Many of the investments have a 10-year period uh, in terms of equity. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so on the equity side, I do think that there is uh, again, I think there is a, a general expectation that you will not get fully risk-adjusted returns. Um, but for some of the funds, for example, that we've invested into and that we look at, they have business models that are that bring scales, and that scale is key as well to returns. So I think that um, what we see is that you know from the left to the right effectively the maturity and the scalability of those investments, they will um, drive returns. Um, and then in terms of debt investments, the maturity of debt investments are shorter than equity investments. So again, you know, it is uh, more feasible to get uh, re returns that are more aligned with commercial returns. And hence, effectively, the answer from um, most of the investors that they do not expect to, to need to take concessionary returns, but they would be willing to do so. They don't expect to lose, lose some money, it costs them some money, not lose some money, but lose some, some part of their return, some, lose some percentage points, give some percentage points. That, correct. But, but, but they're still taking action but before it's clear. That's but I think it is uh, one important point to keep in mind here as well is that, you know, a very, to a very large extent, when we talk about impact investments, you know, to date, a lot of it has been microfinance. Mm. And so microfinance debt, so it is quite different talking about microfinance versus talking about investments into agriculture. So those investments will have different risk return profiles as well and scalability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to make the point that, uh, um, I mean, bear in mind that the return uh, for the last 10 years for most investors has been miserable. Right, exactly. Market rate, not that I mean, bad. I mean, if you, if you, put, if you, indexed, yeah. uh, if you invested on the index in the US mm -hmm. over the last 10 years in, in stock market, you wouldn't have made any money. Mm -hmm. right? right. And, and these days you get 1.5% or 1% in government bonds. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a great opportunity now. To, right. To, exactly. to uh, because the, I'm affected that there's too much money out there uh, investing in 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 a limited amount of papers in a way that only a fraction I'm only I mean a certain percentage of the companies in the world are listed so there's too much too much too much money I, I think there's an opportunity to track some of these funds into into good projects where they mm -hmm. can still get an acceptable return yeah if you get an acceptable and, and, return and it doesn't exactly. take that much to beat the returns that they've gotten in the, in the stock market for the last 10 years exactly so, yeah. so I see an opportunity yeah the market downturn is an opportunity for impact investing yeah, yeah. because you're not getting in the regular thing yeah you know one of the things we also have here is you know that, that and we'll have research later today on the continuing role for giving uh, in this space and the really interesting report by monitor Institute saying that there's a, a new kind of wave of or, or ripple of or something uh, giving to for-profits with the example of Husk Power that was uh, now a real darling of impact investing, doing uh, renewable energy from rice waste. But for uh, a year or so, it took, it took gifts. And so uh, th there's a continuing role for that. So th we're looking at the integration of philanthropy as we go here, as well as some development money. And Voxtra has a, a, a million and a half capacity grant from Norfund. And Tony, this is to you. What do subsidies look like when it comes to impact investments, investing equity in order to be viable? If, if you're not making a little less money and you need some other money at the table, what do those look like? Yeah, no, I think that there is, um, we see technical assistance facilities uh, quite a lot. And we think that there is a real need for those facilities effectively because, um, whether you invest debt or whether you invest equity, what we see is required um, in terms of the funds and particularly in terms of the underlying investees and, and, and companies uh, is quite a lot of uh, capacity building uh, and hand holding. So, um, and, you know, so the, the size relative to the fund size is, is very much uh, in line with what we see in the market. And, uh, and so, more focus on capacity building, I think it's absolutely uh, absolutely the right thing to do. And I think it was, um, Telefi said that there's not so much, or, or Kevin yourself, it's not so much uh, a question around funding. There is funding today. So what we need to do is effectively to, to, to build up the opportunities 
uh, and to make investable opportunities. And one of the ways of doing that clearly is, uh, is uh, an efficient technical assistance facility, but which sits outside of the fund. Mm -hmm. And why is that important for it to be outside of the fund? It's because of the return. So I think that the returns, but also that it's effectively it's separately, it's separately managed, and it serves job. two different purposes. So different yeah, yeah. The, the helping them get up to scale, and then investing in the market rate part of that. Yeah. As you're looking at deals, uh, how? And tell if, uh, w are you finding deals that make sense for debt? Are you finding deals that make sense for equity? Uh, what 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 kind of money it looks like you can deploy in the places where you've uh, you're, you're trying to target? Well, I think most of the companies we um, look at they need uh, a bit of both uh, or a combination, mm -hmm. um, and that's also the reason why we've set up the fund to be flexible enough to be able to do both equity mm -hmm. and debt and anything in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's uh, that's quite important actually because. Uh, um, the the traditional private equity model. If you just try try to mm -hmm. uh, blue take that blueprint and and put it into the context that we're talking about in the developing world and and early stage companies and these mm -hmm. things, um, it, it it might get you into some trouble. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, of course, is the return side. Mm -hmm. You won't make as much as. No, because um, even the companies that go well, the exit markets aren't well developed. Mm -hmm. And the entrepreneurs, well, often it's family businesses and the entrepreneurs aren't looking to cash out. Mm -hmm. um, and so you won't be able to realize that upside that you would need to um, get the typical uh, private equity upside. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these companies will often want other types of financing, mezzanine, convertible debt, um, they would like to, to make an arrangement where they can buy you out mm -hmm. after. So uh, you, 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 it's not an IPO, the company's not going to sell, they, they want to raise enough money somehow to, from somebody else to, to get your money out, but you got them to where they're viable. And that, yeah, and preferably they, they'd like to earn enough money to, to buy us out, right? Yeah. Um, so the IPO is not the typical exit. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. It, it might happen, and yeah. uh, we're it hoping could. to. We, we, can do one of those mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. portfolio, but mm. um, it's not the typical exit. So, um, um, yeah, it's it's important to have capital that can adapt to the realities on the ground and, and offer what's right for each uh, each investment. And technical assistance and and grant money can be a, an important part of that uh, mm -hmm. proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and tell if you know you when you look at a deal that could become the next Spotify or something like that, you look one way. How do you look at these investments? What's different about the way you evaluate this kind of company? And, and what do you look for? And what, what's different? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm still humble uh, when it comes to looking at investments in, in right. Voxtra terms, because we, we've just about started and we have a lot to right. learn. It might be that we sit here a few years from now and we talk about all the things that we did. Yeah, we talk in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that being said, uh, but one important common denominator, yeah. I mean, that, that Lots of differences in the sense that mm -hmm. the, the markets, uh, the value chains, and so on, the, the, uh, and, and risk profiles. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you invest in something in, in Africa, I mean, there's a political risk element, there's the mm -hmm. risk of, uh, of climate changes and, and all these kind of things. While, mm -hmm. while when you invest in, in a technology company in Sweden, uh, there are lots of tech risks and market risks, but we don't normally look at the political risk, for instance. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, th there's a number of differences, but one important common denominator uh, thing that, that, that we see in companies that the importance of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to say that when we in Noison, when we invest in, in a company, in a startup, uh, I have like 10 elements that I look for, but the first five other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we invest in people, mm -hmm. and then that's number one, two, three, four, five, and then number six is like the market opportunity, number seven is the technology and so on, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it doesn't help not having, I mean, if, if, you, if you don't have, uh, the teams are never, never complete, but you need something there, a core to invest into, someone who sort of lives and breeds with a company and someone right. who has the soul of the company. Yeah. And that same goes it, for it's the- It's not the pure analytics, it's, it's the sense of the people and yeah, what I you mean, believe. You can, you can put yeah. anything into spreadsheets and you can make mm, fancy analysis and, and it looks, Splendid, and when and, and the investments in Norson that's gone terribly wrong are, are, are some of those are investments where we've been too fascinated by market opportunity and accepted that the team wasn't good enough for that, mm. that there wasn't that there wasn't the it made sense needed. but the people didn't make sense yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but the same goes for the non-profit world and for mm -hmm. and, and for investments they will look at in in Voxter terms it, and it also go for for philanthropy I mean 
uh, non-profit project that doesn't that, that doesn't sort of embody or don't have the right people or strong people that really really care about what they're doing they they, they won't work out mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. it's in philanthropy but it's also in in agribusinesses in africa it's about people mm -hmm. so that's a very important common denominator mm -hmm. you look for the entrepreneur you, you go see the entrepreneur you see how they work who how people react to them their thinking that kind of stuff yeah um interesting stuff uh, paul when, when you go what what do you look for in an entrepreneur Um, well, I don't think I have a very revolutionary answer uh, to that. Yeah. It, uh, it, it needs to be, uh, you know, an entrepreneur needs to have a, a lot of drive uh, and a, a high problem-solving uh, capacity, pragmatic pro problem-solving mm -hmm. ability. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then, of course, the ethical fiber is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, in doing this mm -hmm. because we... Um, uh, we can't get involved with people right. who, who we can't work uh, right. work well right. in the long term. And uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, and um, and then it's of course it's the entrepreneur, and then it's the team yeah. the team around him. Of course, yeah. that, that's, uh, that's important that's as well. Nice. And and uh, uh, they have to uh, be able to have a good dialogue around um, uh, their strengths and weaknesses, and, and mm -hmm. where they should uh, right. strengthen their team and right. their processes and their governance and all of that and able, uh, able to make the company to scale. Yeah. And so I'll give you the last kind of comment and we'll open up for just a couple minutes of questions. I think we have, yeah. Uh, as you look at this, what is happening that is causing this market to grow, this social capital market to grow, and what's needed, what's missing? Yeah, and no, that's a, that, that is a good, um, it's a good question. So um, I think there's been a, uh, there's been a real sort of shift in mindset, but that goes hand in hand with an increased uh, level of information around the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that with more information around the market, um, the market opportunities, how to invest, yeah. but also seeing an increasing number of good, um, solid um, fund managers out there, and very pleased to see that, you know, Voxtra, is now also growing, mm -hmm. um, that would help to, to grow the market. Yeah. So I think on the one hand, we need to, to really be very focused in terms of helping um, fund managers um, build capacity at the investee level mm -hmm. uh, and make these investments investable right. and some of Working them scalable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then at the other hand, effectively have information out there around the market and also have concrete investment opportunities for investors to to come into. Um, I think that will um, that will help build the market uh, over time. And I think what's going to be incredibly important um, going forward as the market grows is discipline and appropriateness. Mm -hmm. So discipline in terms of how capital is deployed and appropriateness in terms of how investors come into which investment opportunities. Right. So working with the entrepreneurs, making them investable, and then information and making it clear. Right. Do we have time for one question, Miriam? Two, two, one to two questions, if somebody, yeah, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, get that to Daniel, maybe just time for one more, yeah, that's good, we're, and better, the clocks are not agreeing. Uh, uh, hi, Daniel Brewer from Resonance, we're a corporate finance and fund management company in the UK. Um, I just want to ask, Question: uh, We'll ask uh, to say a little bit about um, f uh, focus and uh, of the fund and the complexity of the social issue that you're trying to uh, adapt. We found that um, when we've gone out to raise funds, and we've been a little bit woolly about what the focus might be because we're we're aware of the complexity of the issue and wanted to have flexibility about that. <coughs> we found investors found that very difficult to engage with, but. Um, when I hear your story of, oh, right, we're going to invest in this type of agribusiness and it's going to change poverty and, uh, you know, increase there uh, uh, by eight times, you think that's very, very concrete um, output for a very simplistic uh, 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 single intervention. Um, I just wonder how much you believe in that or, or, or how much that was necessary for the investor conversation. Um, all right. And so, uh, to repeat it, uh, you have a clear metric, uh, eight times the dollars in the companies that you invest in and in their supply chain for every one in. What, is, is, do you believe in that? Is, 
<laughs> so, <laughs> the uh, well, just to be clear, uh, we're not saying that we will raise incomes by a factor of 8x. We're saying that uh, if we invest, say, $12 million, um, the returns to uh, to local communities over that sort of 10-year lifetime of the fund will be 8x those $12 million. Um, and that corresponds to an income increase somewhere in the range of 20%, right? Um, so, so that probably sounds a bit more prudent than, than 8x uh, income increase. Um, and Same number, but one sounds bigger. <laughs> you know, one, one is the supersized version of your impact. <laughs> uh, well, you, you just multiply this all together, and, right, you, and exactly. you get to yeah. 8x the invested you get amount. There. You get there. Um, and um, it's, it's a bit simplistic, because um, uh, if you want to solve the, the big problem of, of low productivity and smaller farming, there's a lot of pieces that need to be put in place. And, and we can only put in, in place a few of them. Um, but it is, if you take the example of seeds, um, if, you, if, if, you, if a farmer get access to improved s hybrid maize seed varieties, uh, instead of his uh, farm-saved seed, that alone can double yields. Um, and you can't measure that exactly because there are vi variability from one year to another uh, in, in weather, and uh, so, so you can't really know, did, was the, the yield actually doubled or was it just you know 1.8 or 2.2? Uh, but you can go in there and survey what happened to his yields, and then you could subtract a little bit for that uncertainty, and you can make a fairly decent estimate of what has happened, and especially if you follow these, these people over, over a number of years. Um, so, so it does make sense and you can... It does make sense. We did a lot of <coughs> analysis to get to that number yeah. and I'd be happy to, to share and, and discuss yeah. that. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, another question. Um, uh, thank you one. very much for this interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Anja Koenig from um, Turkey. I used to be based in Kenya before. Um, I have a question to uh, Telef and Paul about um, the investors, the profile of the investors in your fund. Uh, did you? How many of them are Africans? And when you went on your roadshow, um, did you explicitly target Africans as investors? And if so, what what response did you get back from uh, from them? It's it's a good question, and and uh, the answer is no. We did not specifically target Africans, uh, not because we didn't want to, but we wanted to tap into the network of people where we could release funds from this part of the world that wouldn't otherwise be applied. Uh, in Africa, in agriculture, and, and also where we could use our names and our contacts to, uh, and, and the trust that we have. Uh, I think it would be hard for us, to be honest, to raise funds in Africa because we would be seen as not having enough knowledge on agriculture in Africa. Um, so it would probably be difficult for us to do that, but we wouldn't mind having some African investors. And we do have trusted local partners because we cannot sit here in, in, in Scandinavia and, and follow up projects with our partners in, 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 who are locally on the ground. Yeah, it, <coughs> it would be a great goal to have African investors, but this is where they could raise their fund to have that impact. And then you, you're working with uh, funds that have been investing in Africa for a while that have that street credibility. Well, thank you, I wanna thank everybody here. I think we're talking about the walking the divide, walking into the space and figuring out who you are as an investor and uh, whether you're an institutional investor or an individual investor. And one of the things I think is uh, that 60% said they would take a discount and 60% said they didn't ta wouldn't take it or wouldn't expect it. And uh, lack of certainty is not stopping action. R you know, research is catching up with uh, you know, where the moral hunger is leading folks here. And I think this is a market that's, that's heart-led but that is having the rigor of investing. So I think that's what we're seeing. So I want to thank my participants here. Great job. Thank you.